Uh, so today marks the beginning, uh, as the December 1st, it marks the beginning of our Advent Christmas season. Uh, and what makes this season so beautiful, what makes Advent so beautiful, is that we celebrate the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago and what he has brought to us, but we also look in anticipation for what is to come. It's this, it's this beautiful now and not yet, is what many people would call it in the kingdom of God, a now and not yet it's here now, we, we can experience it now, but it's not yet fully realized. And the church is this great example of that, right? We can easily understand now and not yet by looking at the church because we can see the glory of God in it and how, and how life was intended to be in community. But then, you know, we can also see that it's imperfect. <laughs> we can also see pain and mistakes and conflict and things like that. We're going to encounter those things because we're not fully realized yet, right? And not only that, but we see in recent data that, that only 31% of the global population identifies as Christian, right? And so we can see like with a very real way, we can say, oh yes, the kingdom of God is here, but there's still 70% that isn't living in the kingdom of God. And so we also can understand that it is not yet, right? Are you following me? It is both now and not yet. So we, we not only stand in our current position, looking in hindsight at the cross and at the empty grave and all of those things. And we celebrate and thank Jesus for bringing hope and peace, joy, and love. But we also put ourselves in the shoes of God's people before Jesus' birth. We can look to the pages of the Old Testament and sit and, and understand what it feels like to wait for God to redeem us to fullness. And that very idea is where we are going to be today, okay? So each week of this month, we will be addressing uh, the traditional four topics of the Advent season of hope, peace, joy, and love um, in view of exactly what I just said, right? It is celebrating Christ's first coming and awaiting his second coming. And so today I want to address this, this first word, this idea of hope. Of what does it mean? It's kind of this, this, this foundational piece for this season, because we will have peace forever with Jesus. We will have joy forever with Jesus. We will have love forever with Jesus. But hope, hope is unique in that there's a waiting aspect to it. And so one day hope will end because it will all be fully realized. And so what does this mean? What is this kind of waiting experience that we are engaging with? Uh, and so in order to look at this well, uh, I think we should start in Genesis. Can we start in Genesis this morning? Let's uh, open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter two. We're gonna start at the very beginning. This is the second chapter in your Bible period. Just the whole thing. This is the very beginning. All right, Genesis chapter two. It'll be on the screens next to me as well if you don't have your Bibles. It says this, starting in verse four, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the, the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river, watching, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon, and it winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. Well, side note. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. 
So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. This is the first surgery. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Let's just explain what's happening really quick. You might have been like, what does this have to do with anything Christmas related? We just read Genesis 2. Okay. The goal in looking at creation is because we want to see what did God intend. The way that God created things, exactly how he had them, and he said, this is good, I like it like this. What did that look like? Right, and we could dig into all of this text and this whole story. We could talk about it all day long. Uh, We actually do a course here called Bible 101. If you've taken this course, you understand we spend a lot of time just talking about this story. Uh, And if you want to learn more, you should take it. It's happening again in the spring. Shameless plug right there. Um, But for for today's purposes, I I want us to just kind of look at this from a 30,000 foot view. Okay, and we're going to look at a couple of those things uh, in the earlier part later. But I want us to look at one sentence in particular. This is verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Specifically that last last part. They felt no shame. They felt no shame. God creates man. God creates everything. God puts man in this garden. He, He literally says why he put him there. It says to work it and to take care of it to steward the creation that God has built up. He says, hey, Adam, I want you to to do things with this land. I want you to make something of this, this resource that I have given to you. I want you to do something with it. Partner with me in creating right? And then he says, it's not good for Adam to be alone. I'm, I'm going to put in a woman. I need, he needs a helper. He needs somebody to help him to be, to be in this life with him. And he does all of these things and they're working in relationship. God is working with them. And it says that they felt no shame. That Adam and Eve were created in a certain way and they felt no shame about it. God hadn't created them clothes. God hadn't created those types of things for them, but they were content. They said, this is the way that God has made me. This is the way that God has created everything around me. And with that, I feel no shame. I feel no problems. This is everything as it should be. Let's continue on. This is Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, this animal, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. He didn't say that, but it's fine. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, notice that it added a little piece there. Earlier, God said, these are trees with fruit that are good, they're pleasing to the eye and they're good for food. But now they're also desirable for gaining wisdom. And so she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They say that as if it's just a normal thing that he does. He walks in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Okay, so we're gonna stop here. Right? In the rest of chapter 3, God is going to, to banish them from the garden because they have deliberately disobeyed him. They have chosen their own path, their own way of living over the one that he had designed for them. But there's something so important here. Remember where we stopped in chapter 2? Right? In chapter 2, it says they were naked, but they felt no shame. They felt no shame about the way that God had created them. They had no issues with, with what God had provided for them. But suddenly... 
suddenly. When God says, where are you? He answers, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And God says, when was that a problem? Like what? When, when was the way that I created you an issue that made you afraid? Like, what, what is going on here? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And so what we should notice here is that perfection, the way that God intended it, this Genesis 2 picture of the world was ruptured in Genesis 3. It was ruptured. Adam and Eve chose to go a different direction. They said, I want to I wanna look to myself, to this fruit for wisdom and to be more, to be like God as the serpent had deceived them. What they didn't realize was that they were already perfectly normal. They were already perfect. They were already the way that they were intended to be. They didn't need anything more. But suddenly, they, they look past God. And so union with him is, is ruptured. They can no longer walk in the garden with the Lord in the cool of the day, feeling no shame. No, instead, they are now choosing this life as they see fit. Now, let's bring this forward to the topic of hope. Okay, to the topic of hope. We have this weird relationship with the word hope in our culture. Like, I feel like the, uh, the definition of hope has changed throughout history. Right? Nowadays, when we say hope, we're usually saying, like, man, I really hope this happens. I really hope that it doesn't rain on, on this really nice thing that I want. I want to go, you know, have this big event outside, and I hope it doesn't rain. I want to go do this, and I hope this doesn't happen, or I hope this does happen. I hope I get the job. I hope that this, this baby comes soon because, man, Maddie is 38 weeks today, and I'm hoping this baby comes soon. <laughs> is, that is so real, you guys. It's so real. I'm being so vulnerable right now. <laughs> uh, we are so hoping for that. But that's how we use the word hope right? That's just the way that we use it. It's like, a, I really want something to happen. It's just to communicate my desire. We want a certain circumstance. But when we see hope in the scriptures, it's actually more like how we use, it's a little closer to how we use the word hopeful. Okay, I'm hopeful that this will happen. I'm optimistic about the outcome of this event or, or this, how this, this, uh, these things will unfold. I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful that it will go this way. And even then, it's still not exactly how it's talked about in the Bible because there's still a little bit of doubt in there, right? When I say, I'm hopeful that this is gonna go this way, there's still part of me that's like, but it might not, it might not, but I'm hopeful that it will. That's not how it was in the scriptures. And in fact, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament that, that we translate to hope denotes an, an excited, pleasurable anticipation or expectation for something. It's not like a, man, I hope it happens, we'll see. It's like I, I am sitting here and I'm excited for what is coming. What is going to happen. I'm expecting, I anticipate this to happen. In fact, the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, the word that we translate to hope in there refers to waiting. Just simple waiting. And it, and it often has that kind of pleasurable, excited, like eagerness with it, but it's awaiting something. Let me give an example, okay? That, that this, is, this is to best describe what they understood as hope that we don't really think about anymore, okay? Has anyone gotten up for the purpose of seeing the sunrise or the sunset? A show of hands, have you gone up to see the sunrise or sunset? Yes, okay. This was a common thing in, in Southern California. We just always did that. It was just like, you, you do that all the time. You go to the beach and you go watch the sunrise over the water, uh, you know, if, depending on where you're at at the beach or over the hills, or you'd go, you go watch the sunset over the water. Man, I have so many sunset pictures in my phone at the beach because that's just something that we did, okay? And, and, and when you would do this, when you'd go to watch the sun rise or set, there's something that happens. It's a whole lot of waiting, <laughs> right? There's a whole lot of waiting. And you wanna get there early 
right? Because you want to see the whole thing happen. And so you get there early and then you just sit down and you like put out the blanket or something. You sit down and you wait. You wait for the sun to do the thing that you are coming here to watch it do. And so you sit there with anticipation, some excitement. You're waiting to see it. There is no, there is no such thing as, man, I hope the sun sets today. <laughs> we'll see. Or I hope the sun rises That'd be awkward if it was just dark for the next three hours, you know? Like, no, it's, it's totally and completely, I'm sitting here waiting with anticipation, knowing that in the next 15 minutes, that sun is gonna be in the sky. And I know that that's gonna happen. Let me give you another example. I love the holidays. I love, love, love the holidays. It's the best, it's the most wonderful time of the year, you guys. It's so good. It's so holly and jolly and fantastic. It's so good. And so literally at our house, we decorate our whole house for Christmas on November first, because that is what you do. That's what you do. We put our tree up. We put our lights up. It's fantastic. We get our Christmas countdown out. We're like, let's go. And I don't love just Christmas. I also love Thanksgiving. I, I had the best Thanksgiving this week, you guys. We had three Thanksgiving dinners. Oh, yeah. Smoked turkey. Dude, game over. So good. So good. It was a great time. I love these holidays, okay? It's the, it's the best thing. I always look forward to them. You might see where I'm going now. I look forward to the holidays. I anticipate their arrival. When I get that Christmas countdown set up, I'm like, oh, Christmas is coming. It's happening. Santa Claus is coming to town. Like, let's go. I'm super excited. There is no ounce of doubt in my soul that Christmas might or might not come. I know for a fact that it will happen because as we all know, Time just continues to go on, whether we like it or not. It just continues to go on and on. And so I anticipate the arrival. I know that it's coming soon. And I sit here and I wait. Now, if I were to say that I am putting my hope, okay, if I were to kind of change the part of speech for hope, JD loves that, that I just said that part of speech, that I'm putting my hope in the sun, for the sunrise or for the sunset. It's different than saying, man, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, right? That's the waiting that we just talked about. But to put my hope in the sun, what I am saying is that I am waiting on the sun to fulfill a desire that I have, okay? I desire to see the colors in the sky. I'm not just wanting to see the sunrise or sunset just because it's cool that it goes up or down. Like, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to see the colors, man. I'm here to see the beauty in the sky. I'm here to see all of that, the glory of God's creation shining over the ocean. How how, it's so wonderful. I desire to see that. And so I am awaiting the sun. I am trusting that the sun will fulfill the desires that I have. Are you following me? Right? And so I'm going to say, I, I hope, I wait for the sun to fulfill the desire that I have. I'm putting my hope in Thanksgiving and Christmas to give me family time and good food and all of the holly jolly. Right? It's not that I just like the idea of Thanksgiving and I show up and I'm like, oh, it's Thanksgiving day. And then I just go about like a normal day. No, it's not the concept of it. It's the fact that Thanksgiving means family time and it means good food. It means a bunch of just joyous experiences. I desire those things. And so I await Thanksgiving and Christmas to fulfill those desires. I'm putting my hope in that. That is the kind of experience that we are referring to when we talk about hope in a biblical context. Okay, to hope is to await something expectantly and to place my hope in something is to have a desire and trust that whatever I am hoping for, whatever I am awaiting expectantly for will fulfill that desire that I have. Here's where this rub happens and where we start to see the brokenness and the unhealth that comes from Genesis 3. I put my hope in my employer for my financial coverage, my provision, my ability to be provided for. I put my hope in my employer for that. I put my hope in my financial coverage for my security and my happiness. I put my hope in my relationships that are around me for companionship 
I have a desire for companionship to keep me from being alone. I have a desire to feel loved and valued. And so I put hope in relationships to satisfy that, to fulfill that desire. Maybe I put hope in my work for purpose and for value. I put my hope, we all put our hope in something. For everybody, it's different for joy, right? There is something each and every one of us are putting our hope, our trust in something to provide us with joy. I await and trust in these things to fulfill these aches that I have, to fulfill this longing that I have. And this, my friends, is why we experience disappointment, why we experience stress and anxiety, why we experience betrayal. It's because we are putting our hope, our trust in things that will sometimes let us down. I can put my hope in my financial coverage for my provision and for my security and my happiness, but what happens when, you know, job falls through and then I can't pay my bills? Then what happens? The thing that I put all my hope in has fallen. This is how we experience betrayal, man. Like, it, it, we, we put our hope in our relationships that are around us for love, for value, for companionship, for community, and sometimes those things fall. They fall through, conflict happens, a falling out happens. And suddenly this thing that you were putting your hope in has fallen down. It was not able to provide for you to actually fulfill the desires that you were trusting it to fulfill. This is because we are putting our hope in things to fulfill desires and aches that only God can fulfill. Only God can fulfill these desires. What we truly ache for is life with God. It's life before the fall. It's life in the garden. It's, it's Genesis 2. That's what we long for. Because in Genesis 2, right, we talked about how it's perfect. It's everything it's, it's intended to be. Guess what's happening there? Companionship, value, purpose, meaning, love, delight, joy. All of these things are there with God. But we are looking to all of these other places to try and satisfy this desire for Genesis 2. We're longing for a life with God. And we're like, maybe this will give me a life with God. Maybe this will give me a life with God. Maybe this will give me that. But in reality, God's in the corner over there being like, don't you realize what you're asking for is me? What you are asking for is, is God. And you're looking into all of these other places when he's right there. The problem is that we have disconnected ourselves from God. And so there is a gap. There is a hole in our heart, in our soul, in our lives, this deep ache and longing for what we were created to live in. This is the reason that we long for things like justice and, and, and for truth and goodness and mercy. That's why we, we crave and we long for joy and delight and love and purpose forgiveness, community. We crave those things because we're created to be in them. Those things are meant to be found in God. That's how we were designed. We were designed to live in the garden with God, to have all of those things, to feel no shame. But instead, we're trying to fill this massive gap with all of these other things, putting our hope in some human-made and human-dependent thing to fulfill these desires. It's like putting Band-Aids on a massive wound. Like your whole torso is just torn apart and you're just being like, I got a Band-Aid. I've got this tiny little like, you know, frozen kid's Band-Aid that I'm putting on this massive wound. And you're like, yeah, job well done. <laughs> I've got it covered. The Band-Aid is not going to help you. The Band-Aid is not going to work. And, and, and maybe if you get enough Band-Aids, it might, it might help for a little while. You might, you, might stop, you might stop bleeding everywhere. But eventually, it's all going to fall apart because they weren't intended to do that for you. To bring it back into the, the real form of this analogy, God is intended to do that for you. And this is where we meet Jesus. 
This is where we meet Jesus. Because of Jesus, we are invited back into the fold of Trinitarian love. We are invited back into relationship. We are invited back into this life in the garden. As Paul says in his second letter to the church in Corinth, he says, we are reconciled back to God, back to the one we actually need. It says, so from now on, we regard no one with a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Some translations will actually say the old has passed away. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us, committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God the way that we were intended. We were intended to be the heart, the righteousness of God made in his image. And God through Jesus reconciles us to that, that we might actually receive it, that we might actually become it. This is what we celebrate in Advent. Hallelujah. This is what we celebrate, that Jesus has come to reconcile us to God, to make us a new creation, to recreate us, to start over, to say, hey, I'm going to recreate you like I intended to back in Genesis 2 that we might become the righteousness of God instead of just a bunch of band-aids on a massive wound, that we might actually be whole and complete. And so rightly, Jesus teaches throughout his ministry, and the church continues this teaching through history, that we can put our hope, our trust to fulfill our ache in God. That we can look to God and say, I trust that he will fulfill this ache that I have in my bones. I long for justice. I long for peace. I long for mercy. I long for joy and love and value. I long for those things. And through Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, Christ the Lord, all of those things that we long for most will be restored, both now and one day in the future, both now and not yet. And in the meantime, we wait. We hope expectantly. Just as we wait for the sun to rise, we sit here and we wait and we say, Lord is coming. And so I'm just going to wait for him to renew all things. And how do we wait? It says it in that last passage. We wait by joining him. Listen to this. This is verse 18 and 19 of that last passage. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us that message of reconciliation. So God, in Jesus, has reconciled us back to him. He says, I'm bringing you back. We're gonna restore this damaged relationship. And then he has also given us that ministry to further the reconciliation along throughout the world. He says, here, I'm gonna bring you in. Okay, we're gonna go back to Genesis 2. And you wanna know what's a big part of Genesis 2? What was man's purpose? Can anyone remember what man's purpose was in Genesis 2? It was to work. It was to work this garden and take care of it, to steward it, to do something with it. God is now saying all over again, he's saying, look, I have given you reconciliation in Christ Jesus. Do something with it. Spread it. Go reconcile the rest of my creation back to me through Jesus. Go continue to spread this ministry of reconciliation. He has appointed us and committed to us that ministry. And so there's this initial reconciliation, right? And then we continue to do the work as ambassadors of Jesus. As we live on mission, as we make disciples, as we ourselves become more and more like Jesus and we reorient our lives and our purpose and our hope around him, we, the church, the body of Christ, partner with God to reconcile all things back to him. 
to reconcile all things. That is how we wait. We don't just sit here doing nothing, right? This is something that Paul addresses in the church in Thessalonica when, um, <laughs> when he, he sends his first letter to them and he says, hey, the Lord is coming soon. Jesus is coming back. And a bunch of them just quit their jobs and just like stopped working and stopped doing anything. And they just sat around being like, he could come today. So let's just sit here. Like, I'm, I'm just, give me a drink. I'm just going to chill while, you know, I wait for Jesus to come back. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You should still work. You should still spread the good news because that is how you wait. This is how you wait, right? If, if someone had let you out of jail, if they had ex, if, if just given you this huge opportunity and you acknowledged it and said, this is wonderful, and then chose not, wa not walking into it, that would be ridiculous, right? That doesn't make any sense. If the Lord says, hey, I, this is healing for you, guess what? I can, long, I, can, I can satisfy all of the longings and all of the aches in your soul. And you look at him, you're like, oh, sweet, no way. Cool. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to these things. The band-aids are right over here, so I'm going to get these, okay? Like, that doesn't make any sense. We must wait by walking with him. We anticipate his coming restoration and resurrection life by living into it now. So friends, walk like you know where you're going. Walk like you know where you're going. Don't walk aimlessly saying, oh, the Lord said he was gonna satisfy everything that he's gonna return, but I'm just gonna walk aimlessly around. No, you know what's happening. You know what is coming. You know that the Lord will restore all things. So live with restoration on your sights, on your horizon. Walk toward it. Walk toward the restoration. As it says in Revelation, at the very end of our Bibles, it says, Revelation 22, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. It's this beautiful image of back to the garden. He says, guess what? The tree of life that's back. The river flowing through the city, that is back. All of these things are made right and made new one day. And so although we celebrate with gladness and with joy, we wait on the Lord as well. We wait on the Lord as they did long before Jesus came, only now with even greater assurance and hope in him, right? Because he's already come once. Listen to this from Psalm 30. We should just kind of let this wash over us. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. This is how we wait. We serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. In his word, I put my hope. In his word, I put my hope. I trust that he will satisfy the things that I long for. I wait for the Lord. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. Hallelujah. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. To put that in our context, you know, because we're not all Israel. <laughs> People of God. Church, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem the people of God. He will redeem his church from all their sins. One thing I love about this season more than anything else is the reminder to put hope back in Jesus. The reminder that these other things that I'm looking to to satisfy me are not going to cut it. And I'm reminded of Jesus sitting here, inviting me to be satisfied, to be filled. To 
to get rid of all of these things that don't really address our deeper needs. That the disappointment in our lives, all the letdowns, all the ways that things are not as they should be, will one day now be restored through Jesus, both now in his church and one day in his return. So followers of Jesus in the room, I have a message for you today. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. If you are struggling, if there is, if there is things in your life that are just kind of falling apart, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord, continue to reconcile things back to him and continue to wait for him to restore all things and make them new. Put your trust in the name of Jesus to fulfill this longing for restoration. Let this Christmas and Advent season be a time to recenter yourself. Reflect on the words of Isaiah 40. It says, do you not know? Have you not heard? You're the people of God. Have you not heard this? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So may we depend on the Lord to renew our strength so that we can continue to walk and work in the ministry of reconciliation of all things. Now for my friends in the room that are not followers of Jesus, that you don't identify as a follower of Jesus, whether you are unchurched, you've never been here a day in your life, or you're de-churched, you used to go and you just fell away from it, you didn't like it, you were hurt maybe, something that was forced on you, or maybe you're somewhere in between. I, I pray that, that these words today will put some things in perspective for you. That, that maybe you heard some of this and said, man, this is what I ache for. I do ache for more. Yeah, I haven't been satisfied. I ha- I've been trying to do all these things. I've been looking to money. I've been looking to power and authority. I've been looking to, to, to relationships, addictions, sex, you name it, whatever it is, you're trying to satisfy these longings for more than what is. But you're not satisfied. And those things aren't cutting it anymore. And if that is you today, that those things just aren't, aren't it. I'd like to invite you into resurrection life this morning. Would you like to drink from a well that will leave your thirst forever quenched? Would you like to get to the root of the issue instead of just covering up some symptoms? Would you like to, you know, actually get healed Or are you just gonna keep putting band-aids on your wounds? And sure, the band-aids are difficult to turn away from it. I'll admit that it it is hard to say yes to that. We like our band-aids a whole lot. (laughs) They may not help in the way that we need them to, but they're cheap. (laughs) Just go to the store and get some band-aids. It's very cheap, it's a cheap fix. But what you need is the real treatment. What you ache for is the real treatment of God in your life. And it's way more expensive. It's gonna cost you a lot more. You're gonna have to live a whole different way. You're gonna have to turn some things around. It's gonna cost you everything, Jesus would say, but he's worth everything. I think JD said this a couple weeks ago. I think we want something that costs us everything. We want something that is worth all that we are, do we not? We long for something that's gonna actually satisfy this wound in us. And it costs, but it's life-saving. It's life-saving. We need more than the cheap fix. And so if you would like to accept the invitation and put your hope in Jesus today for the first time, or maybe, you know, it was a long time ago and you were just like, yeah, I just, I didn't actually engage with any of that. And I turned away and I, I did all these things. I, I've had led a whole different life since then. 
If you'd like to put your hope in Jesus today, I would love to pray with you over here after this message. And we'd love to baptize you as well. All right, the baptism is that initial step. It's entry into the community of God. Think of it like an actual act of doing 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that we read earlier, where the old is passed away. The old goes down in the water and you come out made new, washed clean. You come out a new creation, recreated in the way that you were intended to be. Eyes set forward on the coming resurrection. And after today, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to walk this journey with you. I don't want this to be like a, oh, yay, we prayed, and then you left, and you never got talked to again. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about these things. I, this, is, this church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. We're not here to just sit and look around. We want to get healed. We want to heal. We want to restore. We want to reconcile. And this is where we get to do that together for the sake of that ministry of reconciliation, right? To, to heal our neighborhoods and heal our city and heal our state and heal our country and heal our world in the name of Jesus. To reconcile all things back to God. And so I would love to invite you into that this morning. And if you are on the fence about that and you're like, ah, sure, maybe... Or maybe you're not at all into it and you're like, I still have a lot of issues because I like my Band-Aids. <laughs> That's fine. Let's talk more about that. Come find me today. Let's talk. Fill out that Connect card and just write on the fence and then I'll know to contact you. We'll, we'll talk. Like I, we will make sure that we get together and talk about these things because I so deeply long for every single person in this room to find life and life to the full in the name of Jesus. To find life that you were longing for, to find life and healing and hope that you were needing and that you've been craving because you were intended to have it. And so let's walk in that journey together. Let's put our hope in Jesus' name to reconcile us back to God. And so we will wait on the Lord, amen? We will wait on the Lord. Let's pray. And we're going to respond in worship. Lord Jesus, we wait on you. We renew our strength, God. We are tired. We are weary. We are weary from putting on Band-Aid after Band-Aid, from trying to look to all these other things to solve our problems, but they just don't seem to cut it. And so, Lord, we are weary. But Lord, you tell us that if we put our hope in you, we'll never grow weary. We will never tire because you are so good and so faithful. We will run and not grow faint. We will not grow weary because we have our eyes set on resurrection. Amen. We have our eyes set on resurrection. So Jesus, I just pray resurrection life into this room right now. Lord, just as you did with Adam, would you breathe life into our nostrils this morning? Would you breathe life and make us into living, recreated beings this morning, Lord Jesus? Come and have your way. Fill us with your presence. Breathe life into us with your spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, breathe onto us this morning. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Renew us in all things today, Jesus. Renew us in all things. Our hope is in you. We will wait on the Lord to reconcile all things back to its intended purpose. Thank you, Jesus, for reconciliation. Oh, we celebrate you today. More than anything else, we celebrate you and what you have initiated, what you have brought to us, this gift of reuniting us with the Lord, this gift of bringing us back to the garden. We thank you, Jesus. It is our joy to thank you. And so we sing hallelujah. We raise up our songs of joy, our shouts of praise in the middle of our storms, in the middle of the things going on. Lord, we trust in you, the hope of our world, the hope of our lives, the rock of our salvation. We lift up our songs to you and to you alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.